The city of Houston and our region has a workforce that has been heavily invested in skill sets for the oil and gas sector. These same skill sets are transferable to renewable energy. But I think University of Houston is well positioned too with over 47,000 students. Um, we are the go-to training source for our region. Marco Posler, my colleague at University of Houston, Currently, Marco serves on the board of the Houston Maritime Museum, the Industry Advisory Board for the Supply Chain and Logistics Technology Program, and the Conference Content Advisory Board for Break Bulk Americas, and was the past chair of the Exporters Competitive Maritime Council here in Houston. And we ask everyone to sit back and enjoy. In addition to uh, being Chief Operating Officer at UTC, I'm also very proudly an adjunct professor here at the University of Houston. In the U.S., the first prototype offshore wind project, Block Island in Rhode Island, commissioned in 2016. I had the privilege of a water boat tour last year, and it is absolutely impressive. The Biden administration has committed to building 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy in the U.S. by 2030, and has a further goal of developing 110 gigawatts by 2050. The U.S. has only about 42 megawatts of offshore wind operating. 30 gigawatts is 30,000 megawatts, which would provide electricity to approximately 23 million American homes. The focus of our discussion today will be this rapidly developing U.S. offshore wind industry, focusing on the port infrastructure. Melanie Kenderdine, she served in the Department of Energy, both as Energy Counselor to the Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz, and Director of the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Policy and Systems Analysis, and in founding EFI, Energy Futures Initiative, a nonprofit dedicated to driving innovation in energy technology policy and business models some offshore wind port infrastructure needs and you need uh, heavy duty wharves you need uh, manufacturing facilities nearby you need lay down areas and you need dredging so there are a couple of different types of ports that you need to support offshore wind uh, the two main ports that you need are marshalling and manufacturing so marshalling is where you're going to gather all the components they're going to come in from right now they're going to come in from overseas most likely europe um, you're going to stage them and pre-assemble them and then load them onto either jack-up vessels or barges to bring them out to the site. And then there is a manufacturing facility that uh, will eventually be a domestic supply chain that will produce those components, right? So typically you got to work back from commercial operation date for the developers, right? So the solicitation comes out from the state and the developers win the solicitation, they get a commercial operation date attached to the solicitation. That means they gotta flick the switch and spin the turbines to produce power. Uh, then you work backwards to when the port has to be ready. So it's gonna take about a year, one point, a year, a year and a half to uh, construct the project. So you gotta be ready before that. And then it's gonna take you about two and a half years to permit the project. So you've got to be, get your construction timeline. The oil and gas industry especially here in the Gulf, has been a huge opportunity for the local ports. In the Northeast, we never had that experience. So going back to that supply chain, there, there's, there's a learning curve that we're actually, you know, trying to get some of the knowledge from the Gulf's experience. And uh, a lot of that is starting to transition. But again, I mean, New York, New Jersey, you know, we've been container ports, maybe some bulk business, but there's really never been this kind of activity for the offshore wind. Prior to the breakthroughs in shale gas and oil onshore, uh, deep and ultra deep water offshore drilling was a major source of US oil and gas supply. And like offshore wind, those were very, very large enterprises. So your oil and gas industry has a lot of experience with, um, with uh, complex and large enterprises. Uh, the oil and gas industries have experience in building large, complex offshore structures. 
and um, they have federal leasing expertise. They're built, they, they have offshore leasing expertise, and they have other transferable skills, and those are geotechnical engineering, surveying, maritime engineering, foundation package management, offshore construction, subsea engineering, offshore logistics, and shipping. And so, so those with some training, and we have a partnership with the AFL-CIO, does excellent training programs. I would also note in that regard, the, the Inflation Reduction Act has $100 million in it for convening stakeholders and an analysis of interregional transmission development for offshore wind. So there's a big pot of money out there to do a lot of the things that I've just described. And how can the ports work with the states to be better prepared to serve the offshore wind industry? You know, it's kind of that each state is, is more excited than the next state at this point, right? So it's almost like a race. So they're, they're looking at this like first to market, who's going to get the first nacelle facility where there's a blade facility going into Virginia? Who, who's going to start the market, the manufacturing ahead of the curve? And, um, you know, for each state, they're looking at it, they're creating jobs and they're mandating it as part of their solicitations, like uh, Josh alluded to. The long terms of the manufacturing jobs, they, you know, they're, you know, putting in the cell facilities, putting in blade plants. I mean, these are 20 year to 100 year commitments that these manufacturers are making. I think the blades is one of the th key factors that you're going to see manufactured here in the U.S. And I think that that will be one of the faster growing activities. I would say the Biden administration, and this is generic, okay, but they have put $703 million to fund 41 projects in 22 states. It's just for port improvements, not necessarily offshore wind, but several of the projects that they are funding are offshore wind. And so there is funding out there. Um, we need to be very cognizant of the supply chain needs the industry, the port industry represented here today needs to be partners in that, uh, need to move forward quickly. Thank you very much. We're out of time. Thank you for the audience and the panelists. It's been a really interesting discussion here.